the idea that if you have educated people, you get out of this problem. It's a, the opposite of the, opposite of the case. Um, education has been the problem. It's because it's been, it was turned from being the transmission of a culture down through the generations into the overturning of a culture on the basis that the culture was illegitimate, racist, colonialist, and all the rest of it. And we are where we are. So knowledge and wisdom are increasingly unacquainted. Truth has become a right-wing concept. You cannot say it, because if you say it, you are considered right-wing. And to be right-wing is to be in league with the forces of evil. Well, this conversation is with an old friend to this podcast video series, Melanie Phillips. She's a grandee of British journalism, a broadcaster and an author, whose weekly column currently appears in the Times of London. Her writings are available at melaniephillips.substack.com. Melanie, thank you again for the opportunity to talk. You're a very astute observer of events here and globally. Very kind of you to say so, John, and always a pleasure to speak to you. Can I begin by saying we've seen, um, you know, the demise of Queen Elizabeth II in recent times and now the coronation of the king. I don't know how they measure these things, but it's estimated that four billion people watched Queen Elizabeth's funeral and there was a deep outpouring of heartfelt, I think, respect and sympathy for her. Mm -hmm. What drove that admiration for Queen Elizabeth II and what does it say about the way we perceive leadership? I think for many people in Britain, uh, the Queen, the late Queen, had become a symbol of um, something which one doesn't find very much in public life anymore, but doesn't find it being spoken about very much anymore. But the concept of duty and service to others and never complaining, just getting on with it. And these are very British characteristics, the old Britain, um, that Britain, the Britain of tradition, the Britain that's been in existence for hundreds of years. Clearly, other countries and other cultures have those things too, but they're very much identified in the kind of British psyche. And the Queen embodied all those things. She carried out duties until she died uh, with a smile and with a sense of hopefulness. There was always a sense of hopefulness about her. And you wouldn't have dreamed of her, of, of hearing her ever complain about anything. Uh, she was always optimistic and just got on with it. And when she died, people were, I think, mourning not just the passing of such a remarkable individual, but they were also mourning, I think, a Briton that they thought had died with her. They thought she was um, the embodiment of characteristics that had defined Britain for so long and that people, many people fear, are now passing and have indeed passed. And that grief was saying goodbye to that Britain. And that seems very unfair uh, since the Britain has just crowned the new king. Um, and I'm sure that he feels that expectation on him. You know, how can he follow that? You know, what an act to follow his late mother. Um, and the king is a very different sort of character. But people are concerned, they were concerned, and they, I think, still are concerned. Uh, that what she embodied may have passed forever and they don't want it to. I was coincidentally in America, uh, in LA, when the news burst that the Queen was gravely ill and that the doctors were concerned for her. The program I was watching on the early news was interrupted to bring this news flash in America. And <laughs> it was saturation coverage from that moment on, the place that broke away from Britain. Indeed. And I thought that said something very profound. Yeah. Because 
it seems to me we live in a very hedonistic culture. We raise our children to think they're the centre of their own universe, if not the universe, and it's all about them and everything sort of revolve around them. But when we see that value in our leaders, we, we're we repulsed by it. Our own value system, we say, those people think it's all about them. No, it's not. They're meant to be serving us. You talk about this nostalgia for something that people were worried it might have been lost, and yet it's actually our value system. We're recognising that we don't like it when we see someone who has a sense of duty and of servant leadership. It's a value that we don't really associate with um, leaders today. We associate with them self, self-serving um, uh, attitudes, um, if not downright corruption. Uh, we don't respect them uh, in general. We don't think they exhibit leadership. Uh, we're disappointed in them. Um, and this is itself very troubling because what, what we collectively are actually saying is that we're disappointed in Western democracy. And that's another issue. Um, But it's ironic, to put it mildly, that the Americans are so entranced uh, by the British monarchy, which they are, and were so enamoured of the late Queen, which indeed they were. Uh, To a certain extent, it's because, you know, they don't have a monarchy. They famously, uh, you know, got rid of it uh, when they broke away from uh, the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and to a certain extent, they are kind of entranced by the romance of it, the mystique of it, the sheer weirdness of it uh, to a Republican uh, uh, culture. But what I think they would never wish to acknowledge, but I think deep in them, inside themselves, their fascination comes from this. What they won't acknowledge is that the kind of qualities represented by the Queen and by the monarchy in Britain are so immeasurably valuable because what the monarchy stands for is an individual, and what the monarch stands, well, what the monarch is, is an individual who stands above politics, stands above division. The monarch embodies a kind of almost mystical sense of what the nation is. He or she embodies the collective sense of what we, the nation, are. And because they are above politics and above the fray, they are untouchable. The nation is inviolate, therefore. And if you look at America, um, uh, you know, every time one of their presidents is or does something dreadful, it hurts them sort of in themselves because the president is the nation. Um, The president is the embodiment of their ideal of themselves as a nation. So if the president is corrupt or venal or whatever, it hurts them very badly. Whereas in Britain, uh, you know, British people may despise their leaders, but it doesn't hurt them kind of existentially because there is the monarch who represents the best. Now, in Britain's past, there have been monarchs who have not represented the best. And this is also a fear Because although what I've just said is, I think, true, that the monarch stands above the the fray, um, nevertheless, the monarchy uh, is very, very uh, aware that it exists by virtue of public consent and public approval. And if the public ever really fell out of love with the monarchy, it would be over. It wouldn't be sustainable. So there is that kind of tension. But nevertheless, uh, the crucial point about the monarchy in my view, a constitutional monarchy, uh, is that it provides for a point, a focal point of admiration, of stability, of identification, which helps bind a nation together and gives it a sense of itself which is optimistic and forward-looking um, and keeps it together. Well, we're now in a different era. Uh, King Charles has been uh, installed, if that's the word, uh, and his queen with him. A couple of things to draw out here in terms of your thinking. Firstly, of course, the ceremony, followed by a lot of people around the world, but nowhere near, I suspect, the number who followed the funeral. Uh, Ancient rites, religious, a lot of colour, a lot of ideas that people would find foreign and not understand anymore because we don't do history. How do you think people 
will react to the monarchy in view of that coronation service and the powerful reminder that it's an ancient institution that's in some ways pretty different to the way we think now in terms of its the thinking behind it. I think uh, there is, to my mind, a troubling division in terms of age in the population. Uh, younger people, by which I mean people broadly under 40, um, as far as one can tell from opinion polling, uh, don't care about the monarchy, don't rate it, don't understand it, don't want to understand it, whereas older people very much do. Now, certainly among that cohort, among older people, um, uh, uh, there was, and I think possibly among the majority of the public, there was um, a really uh, keen desire for the coronation to be in accordance with the traditions of the country. Um, it's almost like, you know, if we're going to have a monarchy, well, we want to do it properly. And it's an ancient institution, and we want to see it as an ancient institution. And if these are ancient rights to do with the coronation of, a, of the monarch, we want to see those rights. We don't want to see up, updated, relevant stuff. Uh, because then there's no point in having the monarchy. It's that way of thinking. And I think that was probably the majority. And I think those people were very pleased that it was kept, that the core of it was kept in accordance with tradition. And yes, the, uh, the rituals at the heart of it are arcane. Um, and no one's seen them, well, no one's seen them for 70 years uh, since the late queen uh, was, was crowned, quite obviously. But in those 70 years, my goodness, the culture has changed very oh, yeah. significantly. And uh, what people, I think, uh, have never really understood, and perhaps, I don't know, perhaps they still don't understand it, but on this occasion, we actually saw on TV much more clearly uh, than we could have seen in 70 years ago when television had really just been invented. Now we could see it is a religious ceremony. That is the core of it. All the sort of flummery and the handle and all that, around, you know, the, the, the wonderful music and the, 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 the singing and so on, um, is not really the point. The point is that the crowning uh, is um, a, 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 at root of religious ceremony, and the heart of the crowning is something that we can't see. The, the screens are put up around the king, and we saw him. It was very interesting. We saw him stripped, stripped to his shirt, and my goodness, he looked vulnerable. He was just an elderly man, slightly stooped, got a very bad back, in his shirt, bareheaded, and you thought, my goodness, you know, it's, 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 he's stripped of all flummery. And in that state, he goes behind the screen and he is anointed in a ceremony that goes back to the biblical kings of Israel, ancient Israel. That's where it's taken from. He's anointed with holy oil. And that's where he makes his vow, the most important vow, to the Almighty, because there is something above him. And that's why the vow that he gives, which we all hear, to the people is unbreakable, because he's given his main vow to the Almighty. Now, it's a religious ceremony. How are people going to react to that? Well, you know, Britain is a post-religious country. But I think, I don't know, I mean, I would like to think that even people who are not religious are would have been moved by that, by this sense of the sacred, um, by, which, by which I mean a sense that uh, this is something, this is a commitment, the nature of which we don't see anywhere else in public life, and it is higher, deeper, and much more important and unbreakable to us. And I would like to think that means quite a lot to a lot of people, even if they don't go with religion and they don't do all this stuff and so on. Okay, people who are anti-monarchist won't go with this at all. They will just think it's complete nonsense. But uh, the majority in the country are not anti-monarchist. Um, and I think that the majority in the country, you know, there is still a majority who actually value the fact that Britain has an identity rooted in hundreds of years of history, law, tradition, institutions uh, that create British identity, and at the heart of which, and this is very unfashionable, but it is true, the heart of which is uh, Protestantism. Um, because, you know, uh, it, it underpins, uh, I mean, Christianity underpins 
uh, this, the, the, the culture in, 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 in Britain uh, going back a very, very long time. And Protestantism is, is rather later. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, it defines the country and you can't really understand or appreciate the country unless, and, and the nation and what makes the nation unless you understand that fact. And at the heart of the nation is the monarchy and at the heart of the monarchy is the religion. Uh, which we saw in spades uh, at that ceremony. My goodness, it was a very, very Christian ceremony. Um, and it would have put people off, some people. I think most people would have been open-mouthed at it. And a lot, I would suggest, were impressed and moved despite themselves, I would think. I rather hope, and I mean this really sincerely, I worry that you, you, know, you talk, we talk, we talk about understanding and indifference. Well, there's a lack of understanding of our cults. There's a lack of appreciation of it, even a self-loathing. So let's say that's where we're at culturally. Yet only months ago, we saw this outpouring of grief for a queen who had committed her whole life to service. And I would have rather hoped that might ask people or prompt them to ask the question, what's different? What made her committed to us? Why do we so admire her? Um, shouldn't we look again mm. at some of the things that we've become indifferent to? Because our substitute, if you like, set of beliefs and values, if you can define them uh, in any positive way, it seems easier to define them in negative ways, um, are not serving us very well. Well, it would be nice to think that people would have that train of thought. Um, I suspect that not many would, certainly among younger people. Uh, they would have enjoyed the ceremony, they would have enjoyed the spectacle, they would have admired it, they might have been moved in the way that I've suggested, and then they kind of put it to one side, and then it's business as normal. For older people, certainly, certainly, just as with the Queen's funeral, it produced this, this feeling of grief at what was being, what was being lost, and those people would have been watching that coronation very closely. And they would have been pleased that the core of it remained, but they would be looking at the king now and thinking, what sort of monarch is he going to be? Is he going to be like the queen? No, he's not the same person as the queen. What's he going to do with this? And is it going to help put our country's values back together again? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, there is... At the moment, and this is a different part of a conversation maybe, but there is no cultural leadership on offer that suggests any agenda of trying to reclaim what has been and is being lost. So there is a kind of cognitive dissonance. You have this coronation and the funeral of the late queen and then the coronation, which stand for a Britain committed to certain values and traditions rooted in those values and traditions. And everybody goes, this is what we want and we've got to have it done properly and we're so pleased it was done properly and it's great and it's fantastic. And now let's get on with continuing to dismember it. The, these two things are happening together because yeah. there's no leadership to stop the dismemberment and there's no sign of it happening. So this is the problem. Now to go back, I, I, you know, to build on that, with, uh, we've talked about Queen Elizabeth and you talked of the value of the monarchy as being above the divisiveness of politics, if I can put words in your mouth. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's what we're both talking about. Uh, I've been involved in politics for a lot of my life. The Queen was there before I was even born. I have almost no idea what she thought on any major <laughs> issue. <laughs> almost none. Exactly. And I respected her hugely yeah, exactly, for that. Exactly. What I did know is that she believed in the what might be called the eternal values that underpin freedom, dignity, worth, respect for other human beings. That's powerful. I knew she believed in those things. Oh, well, she was a Christian. Very different matter with the current king because we know he has very strong opinions mm. on a lot of things. Yep. And to take one example, in uh, 2020, he spoke very uh, firmly at the World Economic Forum get-together uh, that takes place every year. Uh, as I understand it, pretty much in favour of the Great Reset. 
Now, the idea of the Great Reset, of course, is that the problems confronting humanity are so vast, we need not just a global effort, but almost a, a global government. It's almost the idea of doing away with individual nations doing their own thing. This is a pretty profound, uh, I'm, you may think I'm exaggerating, but I think he's well known for his opinions on a lot of things. Mm, yeah. How does that play out now? And can he move into a space where we, like his mother, expect that he stands for the, the eternal values, if you like, the long-term underpinning foundational beliefs and what have you of, of the British culture and its freedoms uh, versus the fact that we know in many ways he's very supportive of activism of a particular political flavour. Well, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, the first question is, can he be like his mother and be above the fray, given that he comes to the monarchy preceded by his past uh, uh, known uh, opinions, which, as you say, are very strong on a number of issues? Um, and uh, that's going to be very difficult. So the issue is not whether they're right or wrong. I don't no. want to cast judgment on that. No, no. It's the fact that he they, has them. He they're has, divisive. That he has value. There will be people who disagree. Yes. So he would say people don't disagree. <laughs> mm. um, that's his. That's his. That's his uh, view. And he has sailed very close to the wind on 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 a number of these issues because you know there are very few issues in which people really don't disagree. Um, he will be different as king. I mean, he knows the rules. Um, behind the scenes. Uh, one might surmise that he may be urging the prime minister to do or don't do, not do this or that. We don't know. But he's not going to be speaking in public in the way that he was, quite obviously. Um, his galvanizing um, principle, as it were, uh, which accounts for a lot of the positions he's taken on, on, on specific issues, is what he would call and has called harmony. He basically believes in the harmony of all creation. And so he doesn't actually believe there are any, as I understand it, he doesn't actually believe there are any really significant, uh, differ, uh, any significant issues that should differentiate religion, one religion from another, or that differentiates religious belief from um, uh, his overriding concern about the planet and sustainability and all the rest of it. He sees all this as like one mystical whole. That's where he's coming from. Um, now, I don't think that is very, um, uh, uh, I don't think that actually fits the bill in terms of standing above the fray. I think, you know, it, it, begs, it begs too many questions. Um, but um, uh, quite how he's going to behave as monarch, we, we don't know. Um, the problem, as you suggest, is that he's already known to have these views, and so he's seen as that sort of as that sort of figure. Um, but uh, we'll just have to see how it plays out. I have to say, I was more than a little concerned, um, and I think this is before he was crowned. In fact, I'm certain it was before he was crowned. Um, that he. Uh, said that he would look favorably upon an inquiry into the historic associations of the British monarchy with slavery. Now, <clears throat> he shouldn't have said that because the claim that Western civilization is responsible for slavery and that all white-skinned people who are Western civilization should do penance for slavery is such a racially prejudiced position, anti-white position, um, and such a terrible distortion, and such a weapon against Western civilization that it has to be resisted, absolutely. I agree with you. And uh, the mm. idea that Britain or its monarchy is kind of, has some sort of responsibility for slavery is preposterous. As where, from where I'm sitting, there's virtually been there's been virtually no uh, uh, culture uh, uh, in the world which has not been involved in slavery, 
um, that the slavers of old were black and brown skinned in Africa and the Eastern countries. Yes, the West was involved in slavery to its shame, sure, but it was the West that got out of slavery. Britain invented anti-slavery. That was our contribution in Britain to the slavery movement. So yes, the West was complicit, sure, but so was everybody else. And today there are still slavers and they're not white skinned. So this is a whole distortion. So this is an issue that he should never, ever have gone near. Um, and that augurs ill. That augurs very ill because people who need the monarch to be absolutely above the fray in the way that the late queen was are going to hear that and they're going to say, what well, we're, we're already under siege. We as white people are already under siege. We're being told that we carry the historic stain of slavery. We're being accused of being racist on the basis of the color of our skin. And here is the king saying, we've got to look at this in terms of the monarchy as well. That's not going to go down very well. It's a very poor augury. So I'm concerned. Perhaps he might like to ask the question as to why one of his forebears cut, in other words, cancelled William Wilberforce, who was the privileged, white, wealthy Christian male who led the charge to end slavery because that's what happened. Well, indeed. I mean, once, but you know, this is such a can of worms and it's a can that, you know, it's not it shouldn't be open, but it's inappropriate to expect white society to open it because it's not white society's can. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it was a universal Absolutely. horror. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So There would have been no, I mean, slavery is abhorrent. And the fact that we don't focus very much on the fact that there's an estimated 45 million slaves today and they are essentially in non-white societies tells you a lot about the motivation of people who want to revisit the past yep. and ignore yep. the heroism of people in this country. Precisely, precisely. Who ended it. Precisely. With no material advantage, in fact, real disadvantage to themselves. And then to overlook the fact that thousands of white Royal Navy sailors lost their lives on the high seas. Quite so. Seeking to preserve quite slaves. So. Were they racist too? Quite so, quite so. But having said all that, um, the upside, as far as the King is concerned, is that you know he got a lot of flack when he was Prince of Wales. People didn't like many of the things he was saying and people thought he was a bit weird and fine. When his mother died, everybody went, my goodness, now we've got Charles. Um, and then I think public opinion changed. I think the way he comported himself after his mother's death uh, with such patent grief, and he showed to the public for the first time his very, very human side. He is a very, very emotional, and sensitive individual, very. And people began to see this. They'd never seen this. They believe the caricature of him as being heartless and cold, it's absolute nonsense. When his mother died, they saw another part of him. They saw the human side. And he went out, he went out among the people and you know, he made himself available. And this went down really well, really well. And people started to warm to him. And they have warmed to him. And he became much more popular than anyone would have thought before his mother died, much more so. And so I think by the time he got to the coronation, uh, I think he was actually uh, buoyed up, as it were, uh, or surrounded by a tide of goodwill, which people would not have expected. And um, I think he will build on that because he is a kind, kind-hearted, sensitive man, very, very thoughtful, agonized, caring deeply about much of the things that we are talking about, the spiritual vacuum at the heart of Western civilization. He is very concerned about that, really concerned. It drives him. He may find 
solutions to it that he wants to happen, which I would disagree with. That's not the, that's not the issue. He's identified it correctly. And I think that that empathy with the human condition as it is today um, has already come across to people and it will come across more probably if he allows it to, to be channeled in the ways that are open to him. Um, so uh, I think it's an open book how he's going to behave as monarch and how he's going to be able to to function as a source of unity and unification uh, for this rather troubled country. Let's hope so, because many things are eternal and <clears throat> continuity and standing on the foundations of freedom that have been, if you like, bequested to us is important. Yeah, indeed. And the question is whether it can be turned around and pulled back. Um, but that's another question. Time will tell. We can only do our best. Um, to move to something else, you've written of how uh, in this country, and it's common across the West, uh, this uh, uh, seeming obsession with equity is actually obstructing justice because of the way it's infiltrating the f police force. What were you referring to? What's happening in the British police force? Uh, well, these are two separate but related questions. I mean, the question of equity is the sort of social justice uh, um, uh, end game in which everyone is supposed to have the same advantages as everybody else, regardless of their circumstances or regardless of what fate has given to them or regardless of what, how they behave. Um, and uh, uh, that, has, that is behind... Uh, the dominant uh, orthodoxy in, in progressive circles, which is identity politics um, and victim culture and, and all of that. Now, uh, the police force uh, in Britain um, uh, has to a certain extent been uh, taken up with those issues because it's become increasingly politicised over the years. Um, uh, the uh, historic traditional um, uh, status of the British police service, which is decentralized. There's no one police service mm. for the whole country. Um, but the ethos of policing in Britain um, is to be completely independent of political control um, and to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to be bound by a professional ethic of policing, which is to prevent disorder and crime and to clear it up after it happens with the emphasis on prevention that's the most historic uh, uh, role of the, of the police now in recent years the police service across the country uh, but particularly in the metropolitan police has kind of fallen apart um, and it's no longer doing what people require it to do which is the most basic thing of all, which is, you know, to stop my home being burgled and catch the people who've burgled it, um, uh, to stop crime and create, uh, to, to prevent disorder and to, uh, to administer the rule of law. Um, people are finding that the police just aren't there anymore, uh, while at the same time, the police have increasingly been, as it were, feeling people's collars for hate crime having the wrong views. So uh, at the most extreme version, you know, you get an itinerant street preacher, an eccentric, the kind of guy who goes around with a placard saying the end is nigh, and he's preaching a verse from the Bible against homosexuality, and suddenly he's arrested and stuck into prison. Or, as has happen happened, he's surrounded by a crowd of angry public who then attack him and pour water over him or dirt on him, and he's arrested because he's the person who's committed the crime, and they haven't. So it's like, what's going on here? Um, and the reasons are many and various. Uh, part of it, I, I mean, I would, I've been following the police, policing in Britain for a very large number of years, several decades. And I would say a, demor a demoralization set in many, many, many years ago as a result of um, 
a whole string of miscarriages of justice, which were laid at the door of rotten policing. The policing was said to be rotten because they were all stupid. They were stupid because they weren't a university educated and because they came up through the ranks. And so you had this uh, infusion of university graduates. And at the same time, the, the politicians said, we've actually got to be more, more interventionist. And so the police service started looking upwards to politicians as to getting their approval rather than downwards to the public whom they had to serve. And this set in train, I think, a cycle of demoralization, poor performance, rubbish stuff happening, um, and then more demoralization setting in. And then they were accused of institutional racism. Long story, I won't go into it now. I followed it very closely. There was zero evidence of this, zero. You only was, have to make the accusation. Now. There was plenty of evidence of police yeah. incompetence, institutionalized incompetence, and also, I thought, evidence of corruption that was dismissed. Corruption, it wasn't even thought about. Institutional racism. And the police, from that point, became absolutely demoralized and have descended ever since. So it's a whole series of things going wrong. But, you know, this may sound fanciful, but I personally think, having looked at this for many years and having described to you very briefly the, the obvious markers in this horrible saga, which were visible to all to see, I think something else has happened. If you have a society which, in my view, no longer agrees what the boundaries are for moral behavior, how to behave well, uh, to, you know, in, all, in all kinds of areas. Um, the individual is what counts. Everybody else can go hang. Yeah. Um, disorder is no longer disorder. Everything is disorderly. Um, there is no longer um, normative values. We can't have normative values. The very idea of normative values is considered to be itself bigoted because you are discriminating, therefore, being horrible towards, by definition, people who aren't the norm. So you can't have normative values. Well, if a society has no normative values and no boundaries, it no longer informally polices those boundaries. We used to have stigma. Stigma is now out. Stigma is being horrible to somebody. You can't have stigma. Well, stigma was the way we informally policed our behavior. Can't have stigma, no boundaries, no informal policing. Is it a coincidence that the police have collapsed? We don't have any boundaries anymore. How do we expect the police to police boundaries when we say the idea of normative boundaries is racist? It is, it is phobic or whatever. It's impossible. So we have the police service now, this, this, or the, the situation of the police or policing in Britain now perfectly reflects a society with no boundaries, it seems to me. On that matter, uh, a very good American thinker who will remain nameless said to me privately not long ago, he loves Britain, that something started to happen to the British upper classes and the aristocracy between the wars. They lost their sense of noblesse oblige. And you've written, recently written that the whole British establishment has become guardianized the Guardian, of course, being the left-wing paper, for which you once wrote. I worked for it for the best part of 20 years. Yeah, and loved it. Made and me what I am today. <laughs> well, it did, <it>, yes. <laughs> anyway. No longer aligned with where the Guardian has gone to. Um, can you foresee any way that the British media, the BBC in particular, might return to objectivity? Or does it uh, sort of state funding make... Uh, make it impossible for it to change? It's like all these institutions, you know, how do we turn around the BBC? Uh, will the monarchy survive? How do we make the Church of England start preaching religion again? I mean, all these institutions that are failing, you can't, it's, it's, you, you, they won't return to what we want them to be 
unless the culture is pulled back from the brink. How do you pull back the, the culture from the brink? Well, through these, these institutions. So it's a kind of, it's a vicious circle. What the thing needs is leadership. You need basically political, cultural, religious leadership. Leaders to stand up and say, we're going off the edge of the cultural cliff here. We've got to pull back. And then you start pulling back. And then the institutions will, you know, resist or pull back or what, but at least the, at least the agenda will, will be set. You cannot expect the BBC or any other of the, of the, um, the, uh, the other representatives of the, of, the, of the media to restore journalistic objectivity in a culture where it is axiomatic. There is no such thing as objective truth and anyone who believes in objective truth is an imbecile. That is what we're told. That is what we're told. But once there's no truth, there's no principle, therefore politics is only ever about power. Correct. And that's where we are. That's exactly where we are. And, and, and the, the point about the establishment that you wrote of is that you think of them as the people who are privileged enough, if I can put it that way, to have had a really sound education, to be steeped in history, to understand that the institutions of freedom should be defended by those with a good voice. Education. And the ability to speak. Look, uh, my personal empirical experience is that the higher up the educational and social ladder you go in Britain, the more you find people who are irrational, ignorant, and bigoted. The lower down the social and educational ladder you go, the more you find people who are grounded in reality, they have common sense, they are decent, they are moral. Go figure, as they say in America. Why is this? Because it's the universities are the crucible of this ca civilizational catastrophe. Uh, it was the universities which were the principal vehicle for the revolutionary idea that came out after the war um, that um, it was what's been called the long march through the institutions, that you couldn't expect, if you were a revolutionary who wanted to create a new, a new world, and you wanted to destroy the old world of the West and capitalism and the rest of it, you couldn't expect anymore the workers to rise up and seize the levers of power and economic power and political power. That was not going to happen. What you could do was instead to work from within, so you basically seeded ideas into the people who would then impart them to the next generation. And then you would gradually infuse the entire culture. It's happened in Britain to the letter. There's been no resistance to it. In America, there's been resistance. There's a cultural war going on in America. In Britain, it's been a, it's been a rout. Uh, it's been, uh, there's been no resistance. Um, or virtually no resistance. Um, so, um, uh, if you're looking to people who are educated, I'm afraid they are the problem. They are the problem. Um, because, you know, I mean, I've been writing about this for more than 30 years. Um, uh, in when, when, when was it? 1996. Uh, yes, 1996. I published my book called All Must Have Prizes, which was about the collapse of the British education system. And I, I put that in the context of the collapse of, the, of, of a moral consensus about right and wrong, truth and lies, justice and injustice, uh, the collapse of objectivity. Um, as part of this this you know, it, it was a, a post-truth world uh, that was bringing about um, a complete reordering uh, of British society uh, on the basis that all the old traditions that had up, upheld the old order were all illegitimate. Now, that was in 1996, and it was already well underway. You know, we're two, what, two or three generations on from that. And you know, you now have people basically running the culture, who have who are very highly educated, uh, in that, 
So the teachers, the, 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 the children I was writing about became the parents and the teachers or the people who are now running the country. So, you know, the idea that if you have educated people, you get out of this problem, is the, the, opposite, of the opposite of the case. Um, education has been the problem. It's because it's been, it was turned from being the transmission of a culture down through the generations into the overturning of a culture on the basis that the culture was illegitimate racist, colonialist, and all the rest of it. And we are where we are. So knowledge and wisdom are increasingly unacquainted. Truth has become a right-wing concept. You cannot say it, because if you say it, you are considered right-wing. And to be right-wing is to be in league with the forces of evil. It is man a Manichaean division between ideologies of one kind or another and those who don't subscribe to those ideologies. And the ideologies brook no dissent because they represent, in the minds of people who promote them, they represent goodness, brotherhood of man, progress, reason, education. And anyone who opposes them is against all good things. So they are not just wrong. They're not people to be argued with. They're people to be removed and silenced because otherwise um, you're against all good things. So it's, it's that division between uh, good and evil. And unfortunately, you know, if you stand up against an ideology like, I don't know, um, so-called anti-racism, uh, which basically says all white people are bad. Critical theory. Uh, or critical theory. Or you stand up and say a woman is defined by her biology. So you're against transgender. So, as you know, it's, there's no discussion. You are cancelled. You are removed. You have to be silenced. This dissent cannot be permitted. So we're in what... Uh, a thinker of a previous age uh, called cultural totalitarianism. No alternative is to be permitted. Now, first of all, that is an assault on individual freedom, freedom of expression and freedom. But it's also a complete repudiation of reason. Because if you say there is nothing that you can say that can dissent from my ideology, and you say you're bringing evidence to oppose me, well, that cannot be the case. If you're denying evidence and reality and thinking and engagement with an idea, then you're denying reason itself. And so the irony is that in an age of supposed reason, we're so rational that we've dispensed with religion. Only idiots have any kind of religious sense because it's not based on reason. That's the thinking. So we're so rational, we've got rid of religion, and yet we are repudiating rationality completely. This is something that doesn't quite add up. So I would say that we are in a new age of unreason. That's what we're in, an age of unreason. That's what we've unleashed. And it's an irony because we've done it under the aegis of being rational. Um, but in getting rid of religion, we have unleashed an age of unreason, and what follows from that is the, er er the erosion of freedom, freedom to think, freedom to speak, freedom to act, um, and a complete confusion about uh, uh, where the limit should be drawn between what I want and what others need. My duty to others and my wish to realize my own potential. In other words, you know, it's I versus we, and all those things. And uh, the confusion is epic. Um, and But that's where we are. But again, we have no cultural leaders, religious, political, whatever, standing up saying this. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I may be naive, but I'm pretty sure that what I'm saying may not be thought about in these terms by many people. But I'm pretty sure that if 
enough leaders got up and, or if leaders got up and said this, it would start striking chords because people, you know, people need to live in a society which is civilized, which looks after the welfare of others rather than yourself. We all know this. We all know this. But we've kind of allowed ourselves collectively to, to ignore it and push it to one side. It requires leadership. We don't have it. That's the problem. Yeah, just to, I suppose, to tease those out, a couple of your points there. Firstly, people must be aware that this is not going well. This is hardly producing a harmonious and coherent society in which people can flourish. Mm. And I think the second thing though, is this. As you say, people must be aware, uh, broadly speaking, uh, that it ain't going well but, and it requires leadership. But this is an age of disengagement. People feel afraid, I think, to step Very into so. leadership. I mean, you know, you think it's important to remember it's not just political leadership. It's not just a prime minister in a cabinet. It's leadership in the smallest community, even if I dare I say it, in the family, it's in the local community, it's in yep. schools, it's everywhere. We need leaders yep. who are prepared to set a vision and articulate it and encourage people to work towards it. I think what you say is, 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 is so true that people are very, very frightened to say anything, to th even to, to allow themselves to think stuff, because you know we're sort of we've we've been we've been we've been so badly affected and so badly threatened, and we can see the consequences of stepping out of line. So we don't even dare think that. You know, if I think this way, maybe I'm a bad person. Maybe I am a racist or a phobe. I mustn't even think that. So that's how people. A lot of people are like are like that. But if you get somebody standing up and saying it, and I know from my own experience. I say things which are unsayable, considered unsayable. And I know what the reaction I get. I know the reaction. The reaction on the one hand is like, you know, excoriation and further cancelling and, and vilification. Right, okay, right. But the reaction I'm interested in is the reaction from the silent, whatever they are, majority, I hope, but the silent. The silent write to me or they speak to me and they say, you know, I didn't know that's what I actually think. Or they say, um, I've been thinking that, but I didn't dare. I didn't even dare think it. Mm. But you've made me realize that I'm not alone. And you suddenly think, my goodness, all these people are sitting there too frightened even to think these things. But if somebody actually comes out and says it, then they all go, yes, that's correct. So there is, I'm sure, this great untapped reservoir of civilized thinking out there, which is being silenced and stifled and is, and, and is too frightened even to think that it thinks it. With proper leadership, you would un untap it. Um, uh, you would release, the, you would un undo the tap and it would flow out and we would be transformed. But there is no leader who is prepared to take this risk, either because they don't think like that, because they've signed up themselves to all this thinking, or they do think like this, but they're far too frightened to say so. Uh, or, um, you know, uh, it's not that they're too frightened to say so, but it's not politic, um, they've got other fish to fry, or whatever. But for whatever reason, we don't have leaders saying it. Instead, we have leaders like Sir Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party, saying, the public aren't interested in the culture war. I mean, excuse me? I mean, he is so wrong. And we know that you know, if, if he comes to power, we're going to get the culture war. We're going to get it, you know, big time. Um, but that's another matter, whether he's right, whether he's politic, whether it was, it was, it was sensible for him to have, to have said that. But this idea that the, 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 the public isn't interested um, is such a misreading of the anguish I think many people feel uh, when they, you know, they're, 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 the, the, the confusion. You know, we're being told, you know, we can't say what a woman is. We're being told that we are awful because we're white. Uh, we're being told this, we're being told that, we can't think this, we can't say this. I mean, people are beside themselves about this, actually. 
So they have, you know, they have other things to think about during the day. You know, how am I going to pay the grocery bill? Obviously, looms very large. But, you know, it doesn't take much to tap into this very visceral feeling that we are losing something that is, is of existential value to us. And we may never get it back. And it's a kind of panic out there. Um, and, you know, it can easily be turned around if only we had leaders with the vision and courage to lead. Well, you're leading. Well, I, I'm... In your cabbage patch. <laughs> now that's well, important. Very small cabbages. <laughs> but it's important. You know, it's a rallying call. Well, there yes, yes. To... But, you know, it's hard to find platforms. Now, it's easier now because we've got social media. Um, I'm on Substack, uh, which is a fantastic platform. It allows me to say what I want. Uh, but um, how many people really tune into this? I mean, still the mass media, the mainstream media, still commands the culture. Uh, politicians run f in fear not from social media, but from the mainstream media. That's what, they, that's what they take notice of. So that power still remains. And that most powerful platform, the mainstream media, is almost completely closed to the kind of ideas that I'm talking about. Not completely closed. There are newspapers which do permit this from time to time and so on and so forth. But, but by and large, the, 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 the main volume of, the, of what comes at us does not permit this, um, certainly in terms of broadcasting. It does not permit it. Uh, it gives us propaganda from the other side. So it's very hard to, um, uh, to make enough of a difference. And that's where, one, where, again, one needs political or cultural leadership, uh, which can cut through all that and which can, you know, which commands its own platform. In the same theme, I'm often staggered by the reluctance around the world to recognize, and I think this is probably very dear to your heart, that Israel is a vibrant, thriving democracy where citizens enjoy freedom and a high quality and a high standard of living, notwithstanding the dangers of rockets flying everywhere. Why is that not more broadly recognized and Israel better understood as a democracy and a light to a better way of life in that region? Uh, That's a big one, I know. It's but. a very big issue and I can't really do justice to it in the short time we have available. I mean, I spend most of my time now uh, in Israel um, uh, for all kinds of reasons, which we can talk about on another occasion maybe. Um, and so I see it up front there and I see up front here in Britain, how Britain treats Israel and how Israel is treated by uh, the so-called civilized world. I say so-called because the way it treats Israel is not civilized and it betokens something very badly wrong with, that, with, with Western civilization. Why is Israel regarded in this way? Um, well, there are there, is an, there are a number of kind of proximate re reasons. I mean, by proximate, I mean they are kind of contingent uh, in the sense of, 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 of being politically expedient. So, for example, the historic um, uh, dependence upon the Arab world, uh, Arab oil, has distorted a lot of political priorities in the West, that, ki that kind of thing. Um, but basically, fundamentally, the 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 Western world, apart from those bits of the Western world which are pro-Israel, there are bits of the Western world which are pro-Israel, they do get it, they do understand. But by and large, the Western world does not regard Israel as a legitimate entity. Uh, why is that? Because they don't really regard the Jews as a nation entitled to live there. Why is that? Because they have bought into a lie that they've all told themselves about history, uh, a lie in which they are themselves complicit, especially the British. Um, uh, so they've, they've constructed a mythology about the Arab, Israel, and Pass. The mythology is you've got two sets of people with a claim to the land, 
not for us to say anything about those claims, but they have a claim to the land. It's so obvious. Just divide the land. And then it's over. Why aren't they dividing the land? Well, Israel is in the way because Israel says we can't agree to this, we can't agree to that. So Israel's in the way. Okay, this is a complete misreading of what's happened. It was never a fight about the division of a land. The fight is over the historic commitment by the world community to settle Jews in this whole land, what is now Israel, what is called the West Bank and Gaza, on the basis that this was the ancient kingdom of Israel to which the Jews alone were entitled because the Jews alone were the people for whom it was ever their national kingdom. And at a certain point in history, there were enough people who knew their Bible and who knew history enough to say, we have to return them uh, to the land. That commitment was entered into by Britain. It reneged on it. It reneged on it because it was up against Arabs who wouldn't have it, um, who were themselves incited by the then new brand of Islamists who were intent on the jihad, politicized Islam. Um, and in response to that, the British decided to divide the land and they offered part of it to the Jews and they offered part of it to the Arabs and the Arabs said, no, we want the Jews gone. And that's been the history ever since that the Jews have always said, we'll take whatever you're giving us, whatever you're offering, We'll, we'll, we'll divide it now, we'll give them a state of their own if they want it. And the Arabs always said no. Now, the West can't accept that. The West cannot accept that this is a 100-year war of extermination against the Jewish homeland by the Arab or Muslim world. They can't accept that because to accept it would mean that, they, that it's, it's, it's a total war and it, there has to be a victory. If, you're, if you say that you know, it's, it's wrong to have people, the Arabs, who want to exterminate this people, uh, it's wrong for all kinds of reasons, then you have to support the Jews of Israel in their attempt to, to fight off this aggressor. But the West doesn't want to do that um, because it doesn't want a conflagration, it doesn't want to get involved, it doesn't want to have... Uh, um, uh, whatever it, whatever reason, it doesn't want it. And so it's invented this mythology that it's just a land dispute. Um, and as a result, it has encouraged and incentivized Arab rejectionism. Because if it's just a land dispute, then it's up to Israel to give, to give, to give. And it ignores the fact that Israel has offered and been refused because that gets in the way of the narrative. It's a land dispute, it, there has to be a compromise. Um, and so if they were to come down against the Arabs for not compromising, then there might be repercussions in the West. So they can't go down that route. So it's the connivance of the West at a big lie. And Israel won't have it. Israel says, excuse me, we are not going ever again to sit down and be exterminated. We're going to fight to defend ourselves. And we'll do it in a proportionate way. We will do it in a way which you don't do, you the Americans, you the West. We will take care as far as we can to avoid civilian casualties. Our record is greater than any other military force in the world in the ratio of combatants to civilians killed. We kill very few civilians. Doesn't stop the world from saying they are actually killing children deliberately. Such a lie. Um, so, but Israel basically says, we're going to use force to defend ourselves because how many, we're... How many missiles aimed at Israeli territory you mentioned? Well, in, in Lebanon, there are something like 150,000 missiles sitting there by the, uh, under the aegis of the Iranian-backed Hezbollah aimed at the whole of Israel. 150,000. Yeah. And Iran is there with a sort of pincer movement. Iran is funding the Hamas and the PIJ in Gaza, they fund uh, the, uh, they, uh, these people are now in, the, in what's called the West Bank, which is like 
um, down the road from Jerusalem, um, and they're into um, uh, uh, they're in Syria, uh, where they're trying to to install again batteries of rockets. Um, this last episode was it a few days ago, uh, uh, within the last twenty four hours, whenever it was that the Israelis killed three Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists in Gaza, which has produced barrages of rockets today from Gaza into southern Israel. I read today one of those guys that was uh, killed in the raid, whenever it was, uh, was a, about to install um, rocket batteries uh, in the West Bank. It's like it's like like in North London. That's the sort of distance. Um, I mean, this is like unthinkable. But the West goes, well, you know, that's just your problem, and we expect you to resolve this by peaceful means by negotiating with the Palestinians. And it's like completely mad because the Palestinian Authority, forget the Hamas, the Palestinian Authority has said, uh, or the Palestinian Authority, uh, you know, does everything it can uh, to uh, reject Israel's existence. It teaches its children the whole time that their highest calling is to murder Israeli Jews and steal their land. And this is ignored completely. Uh, they not only do that, the Palestinian Authority, they pump out Nazi-themed anti-Semitism of an unmistakable anti-Jewish character of the kind that we associate with medieval Christianity and with the Nazi period. Nothing of this is featured in the Western media, nothing. Instead, it's a land dispute, it's Israel's problem, Israel is expansionist, it's this, it's that, ignoring the history which is that the only people who have any legal, moral, or historical right to the, any of this land are the Jews. Ignore that completely. It's astounding. Now, in my view, if you have that kind of moral corruption in terms of international dealings on the part of the West, it's a corruption which doesn't just stop at Israel. It's a corruption which basically is, is, is based on an inversion of truth and lies, justice and injustice, victim and aggressor. And it's no coincidence that that's exactly what the West is doing to itself, the identity politics and all the rest of it. It's a complete loss of moral compass. Now, which drove which is an interesting question. But I would strongly suggest that the default position of support for the Palestinian cause, a cause which is fundamentally exterminatory, genocidal, and jihadi, the default support for that cause among all right-thinking people in the West is a very important reason why the West has completely lost its moral compass over everything. It's at the very heart of it. Um, just as the original bedrock values of the West are the values of the Christian Bible, which is based on Judaism, just as the assault, therefore, on Jewish values is at the very heart of the assault on Western civilization, it's no coincidence at the very same time there is this onslaught on the collective Jew in Israel and an associated tsunami of anti-Semitism throughout the West. These things are all connected. Join up the dots. It's hard not to be deeply concerned by what you're saying and what it might lead to around building really frightening capacity, one assumes, with their nuclear program. Now Saudi Arabia looking like it's joining up with the powerful kid on the block. The Americans ambivalent, tendencies towards isolationism. It looks like a cocktail for a very ugly future if people don't come to their senses. It's extremely frightening. The whole thing is extremely frightening. And, you know, 
there is a sense of everything kind of coming to a kind of explosion point, both in terms of internal civilizational tensions and external geopolitical uh, dangers. Um, everything seems to be going in the same direction. Um, and one can only hope that among people who count, um, you know, there are going to be people who actually can see what's happening and are going to pull back, do what's, do what's, do what's, do what is required. Um, but, you know, unless, unless the Western world gets its head round properly, this idea of, you know, the distinction that has to be drawn between right and wrong, truth and lies, justice and injustice, victim and, victim and aggressor, and untangle the tangle, uh, it's not going to do it. Uh, so let's hope it does. Let's hope indeed. Uh, and you think and write with crystal clarity. So I just say to our listeners, um, sub Substack and your writings in the papers here uh, and your books, uh, they're very clearly set out, beautifully put together. They demand your attention and I commend them. That's very kind. And it's always such a pleasure to, uh, to speak to you. Thank you.